Hey everyone, and welcome to Private Podcast, where we plug in and explore the intersection of privacy, human rights, technology, and democracy. I'm your host, Derek Silva. Today, we're speaking with Jason Peelmeyer. Jason is the Policy Director for Global Network Initiative, or GNI, a multi-stakeholder group of companies, civil society organizations, investors, and academics who are helping to protect and advance freedom of expression and privacy on the internet. Prior to joining GNI, Jason was a special advisor at the U.S. Department of State, where he led the Internet Freedom, Business, and Human Rights section in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, a a section of the the department that I had no idea existed, so that's cool. Uh, Jason, thanks so much for taking the time to be here today. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Great. Uh, We were talking a little bit before we started recording about hockey, but we're going to focus this instead on human rights, AI, and a bunch of other things that you've done uh, some research on in the past. So let's get started here. What is the Global Network Initiative and what are some of the key issues that the organization is focused on? Yeah, GNI is a pretty unique organization. So we are a membership organization, but uh, we're not an industry association, although we have technology companies uh, from around the world uh, as members. We're not a coalition of NGOs, although we have um, lots of human rights and media freedom organizations uh, in our membership as well. Uh, We also have academics, both institutions uh, at universities like the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard, uh, as well as individuals who specialize on uh, relevant themes in their research uh, as members. And we also have investors as members. So it's a big tent. Uh, <clears throat> with a lot of expertise uh, from various different perspectives, all of those folks kind of come together through GNI to work on issues related to freedom of expression and privacy uh, in the information communication technology and ICT sector. Uh, primarily, what we're focused on is how governments and companies interact when it comes to content and user data. Um, so, the demands and restrictions that governments put in place and companies have to deal with uh, as part of their business operations all over the world. Cool. Okay. And what led you to join GNI? So you mentioned uh, before I came here, I was at the State Department in the Human Rights Bureau. I worked on a range of different topics uh, in my time there. Uh, Eventually ended up heading up this um, new section uh, in the Human Rights Bureau, really focused on a couple of emerging areas of human rights practice. So um, on the one side, internet freedom, right, issues of how human rights, the traditional human rights manifest in the digital space and how do we think about protecting those rights in that new space. And then uh, related to that, um, but also, you know, applying more broadly than just on the internet, um, this area of business and human rights, which is a a sort of of evolution of the traditional concept of corporate social responsibility, unlike earlier conceptions that really focused on kind of philanthropy and what can companies do, you know, outside of their normal business operations to help people, um, whether that's their employees or local communities, uh, and more focusing on what what are their responsibilities as they build their business? What what are the right ways for them to protect human rights in the day-to-day operations of whatever it is that they do, whether that's a mining company, you know, extracting platinum somewhere uh, in the world or an internet company expanding a, a service uh, that's available to users anywhere in the world. So those those two areas were kind of my focus at the State Department. Um, and the GNI actually sits um, right at the intersection of the Venn diagram between sort of internet freedom and business and human rights. Um, so it was an organization that I came to know well in my work uh, and one that I had a lot of respect for. And um, it was a pretty seamless transition, a great opportunity for me. And I've uh, really enjoyed being here uh, ever since I moved over. Awesome. What are some of the, uh, maybe maybe some major examples or, or examples that, that stand out to you of where those companies actually started to take some of those actions uh, and in order to help protect human rights? Yeah, so it, it may be helpful to talk about kind of the origin moment for GNI. So a little sure. over 10 years ago, um, <clears throat> big companies like Google that are still around and, and others like Yahoo that have gone through sort of transformations, but at the time we're, we're really at the, the tip of the spear in terms of developing um, user services on the World Wide Web, on this kind of new communications platform that was the internet, um, were beginning to realize that they, they didn't just have to follow US law, uh, which is you know the law that, that governed their incorporation and, and where their headquarters were for the most part, 
Um, but but increasingly, because users were starting to pick up their services and, and um, become consumers uh, and users of their services all over the world, governments uh, who had jurisdiction over those users uh, started to make demands of those companies, whether that mm -hmm. was a demand for certain content to be censored and removed or for user data uh, to be provided for some sort of law enforcement investigation or other government need. And, um, you know, that that presented some tricky issues for those companies, especially in countries where it was clear the governments didn't have the same respect for user rights uh, that the companies felt was important uh, as part of their ethos and that they had sort of grown accustomed to in terms of the protections provided by US law. Uh, and there were some high profile incidents where um, journalists or other activists um, you know, ended up having their data handed over uh, to their home government by one of these, you know, large platforms, uh, and they were eventually, you know, might have eventually been prosecuted or, or worse uh, on the basis of that. And uh, that got the attention of lawmakers here in the U.S. Certainly, the media picked up on it, uh, and it it really focused everyone's minds around these questions of, okay, well, what does it mean for an internet company um, that really, you know, is operating everywhere in the world simultaneously um, to protect users' rights? How can a company do that in a meaningful way, you know, despite all of these government demands and, and the push and pull uh, that they're facing. Right. And they came together uh, in conversation with a group of independent academics, a group of civil society organizations with human rights backgrounds. And, and out of those kind of initial and, and, and you know, somewhat contentious, I wasn't around for them, but from what, I, what I've heard, what's been passed down, um, conversations emerged an agreed set of principles, which are the GNI principles on freedom of expression and privacy, um, that basically sort of guide companies um, in how to best protect their users' rights in the face of government demands or restrictions. Um, the principles don't tell companies that they have to always follow whatever domestic law uh, is being asserted. Neither do they tell them that they must always resist uh, a government demand. Um, but what they do do is offer a framework for analysis so that the company can do whatever is within you know, their uh, capacity and, and using their own judgment um, to protect their users' rights to the maximum extent possible. Um, and over the years, you know, the, the types of scenarios that companies are facing, the kinds of pressure that governments are putting on them uh, have obviously changed. And we'll talk about that uh, over the course of the podcast. But um, it's been really valuable, I think, for everybody who's been involved in GNI that there is this shared space to be able to share lessons learned, to get advice, uh, sometimes from some of your fiercest critics, um, but in a way that's you know, constructive and proactive, uh, and to also be able to join forces in terms of then speaking to governments and trying to provide advice to them about how you regulate legitimate concerns about harms that are occurring in the digital environment, but in a way that's, that's not likely to undermine users' human rights. Right, yeah, I, I do remember this is probably about a decade ago, uh, Yahoo coming under fire, particularly. I think it was with the Chinese government handing oh, over some right. data about yeah, dissidents in, in China. So I, journalists, what have you, I do remember that. And then <laughs> I, I don't even think this case is over. Uh, another decade plus old case where Microsoft has been fighting or fought the US government over email data that was stored in Irish servers um, in a data center in Ireland Microsoft saying, nope, that data is in Ireland. You need to go through the Irish government, Irish courts to get that data. And US government saying, no, you're an American company. <laughs> you need to hand it over because you're based here. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it was literally maybe just a year or two ago where that got escalated either to the Supreme Court or another appeals court. And, uh, and, and I remember thinking to myself, this is still going on. Like, I remember this case from when, when I worked at Infotech Research Group back in like, 2009 like this is i can't believe this is still going <laughs> yeah no that case the microsoft ireland case did go to the supreme court um ended up kind of being mooted by a piece of legislation that was passed um, by the u.s congress called the cloud act which set right. up clarified both the u.s government's jurisdiction over data even uh, over data held by u.s companies even even when it's held abroad but also set up a mechanism whereby other governments who are seeking uh, content data from U.S. companies um, could have a more expedited access to that. The way it's traditionally worked um, for you know decades, if not centuries, is through what are called mutual legal assistance treaties, so bilateral treaties 
signed between certain governments saying, hey, if I need evidence from you and, and it's only available in your jurisdiction, um, you know, this is how I'll request it and then you provide it to me. You know, that worked for many, many years, but with the advent of the internet, you know, almost every crime now has some sort of digital component. And because so many of the services are American, so much of that data and content is stored here in the US, um, there's actually a law that blocks US companies, the Stored Communications Act, from providing that data directly to a foreign government. In a way, that's very helpful, right? Especially in a situation where the company thinks the government is being too aggressive or asserting more authority than it actually has to get access right. to the data. The US company can say, hey, would love to help you, but, but I'm prohibited by US law. On the other hand, though, that, of course, can be quite frustrating for uh, government officials who have a legitimate law enforcement need and trying to investigate a crime, and they need that information quickly to have to go to the US Justice Department with a request um, and meet the US burden of proof uh, under US law, which is actually, you know, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a higher standard than, than most other countries have, um, yeah. is frustrating. It takes months. And, um, and so this Cloud Act attempted to address that concern as well. Um, and the kind of the ideas that ended up being represented in the Cloud Act were ones that actually, um, you know, were discussed at some length initially at the GNI, um, the kind, this is the kind of issue where you know companies and, and civil society organizations can come together and say, hey, look, we're detecting real frustration on the part of a lot of governments here. Um, something's got to give. It's it's incentivizing data localization measures. It's it's yeah. incentivizing governments to hack into endpoint devices as an alternative, right, way to get access to data, and that's not good for human rights either. So let's think about a way that could be sort of you know, that could help address this need, but at the same time, will protect users' rights. The Cloud Act, um, you know, ultimately GNI didn't end up taking a position on the Cloud Act, but uh, but that's the kind of conversation we have really on a weekly basis in GNI is about these kinds of evolving dynamics and tensions and how do we sort of try and be part of the productive, constructive solution uh, for the digital age. So uh, before we get into s some current events here and, and even talking a little bit about what, what GNI is looking forward to uh, in the near future, does G GNI or, or even just yourself have a position on uh, laws like GDPR uh, from the, what is the general data, data protection, protection regulation, regulation and um, California CCPA, similar but th slightly different. Th does GNI have a particular stance on laws like those or again is that something where you're like ah it happened <laughs> we're not going to take a specific position on it yeah it's a, it's a really good question it actually points to an issue that's been um you know it's had a little bit of friction for us over the years you know, gni was really focused uh and has been since the beginning and still is on that sort of intersection between governments and companies and so to the extent that a company was you know, had a had a sort of terms of service with their users that allowed them to use their users' data um, to market information to them or to target advertising or even to, to sort of provide that data to a third party business. Right. Um, you know, if that was done outside of the context of any government interference or any government demand or restriction, it really falls outside the scope of what we were set up to deal with. Similarly, on the on the censorship side, right? If a if a company decided, hey, you know what, we're a knitting platform and we only want conversations about knitting and we're going to censor anybody who talks about, you know, uh, other hobbies that aren't related to knitting and politics <laughs> on our platform, <laughs> they're welcome to do that, of course. Uh, and as long as there's no government, you know, requiring them to do that or interfering right. in the way that they exercise that right, again, that falls outside of our remit. And so it's been a challenge for us, you know, to be perfectly frank as a messaging matter to say, hey, we are this big network of really important organizations working on free expression and privacy in the digital age. But then to sort of put an asterisk next to that and say, except only where there's a sort of clear government nexus. Um, mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. things like GDPR and California Consumer Protections Act, we have not taken positions on. Um, they certainly do influence and impact our work. Um, and so there are, for instance, examples of you know um, individual cases for example the google case with the french data protection authority about the right, right. to be forgotten you may yes. remember that one oh, wow. um we took <laughs> positions on that one um basically saying you know that that the right to be forgotten at least as as the french data protection authority was asserting that um 
was too expansive and would actually interfere with freedom of expression for users outside of France, as well as mm -hmm. people inside of France. Uh, right. One of the things we're very concerned about, and you, you, you sort of uh, nodded to this in, in your original reference to this Microsoft Ireland case is, you know, how do we agree upon the conception of jurisdiction on this global internet, right? Where one government's authority begins and ends. Um, and, you know, in some of these cases, GDPR is a good example of a law regulation that the European Union has set that was meant to protect people in the EU, but has really become a global kind of default for data protection. And without taking a position on whether that's been good or bad, um, it has certainly had, I think, ramifications uh, beyond even what the, the original uh, sort of proponents of it thought uh, would be the case. And so, you know, we have to sort of collectively help governments understand that when they regulate the internet, they are, even if their intent is really just to protect the people within their borders, they are often having impacts one way or another on citizens outside of their jurisdiction. And they have a responsibility to think those through and try and really understand what those are and, and, and figure out if that's you know, something that they can mitigate, if that's something they actually want, um, what, what, what foreign relations and sort of conflict of law uh, type scenarios they might be creating. Yeah, I, I think that's probably one of the biggest things that up until maybe very, very recently, and maybe probably going forward, <laughs> at least in some situations where most regulators, lawmakers, just haven't, they haven't thought about that. They haven't thought about, oh, well, if we institute GDPR and CNN.com is typically available to everybody in the world, and, you know, CNN International certainly is the default for Germans or Swiss, uh, uh, sorry, maybe not the Swiss. They're not. I don't think they're part of the EU, uh, or at least they don't involve themselves very much. Germans and the French um, and the Italians uh, visit CNN.com International. I remember there being a bit of a hubbub about like, well, what are we going to do? Like, we're going to have to change all these. You know, a CNN International going to have completely different tracking and cookies and all this other technological stuff that that underpins the website and their ability to obviously make money and that sort of thing, uh, or not. And I do remember, at least for a very very brief period of time, a couple of American uh, uh, newspaper websites just not being available to Europeans at all. Yep. So, you know, mm -hmm. if, if somebody, if an American expat living in Cologne, uh, wanted to check in on like the Chicago sun times or something like that, they couldn't, uh, yeah. I think the Boston Chronicle uh, was, was not, or Boston.com or something like that was not available for a little while. Uh, I, I might be misremembering some of the references, but yeah, there's, that's certainly something to, to take into account. And it's, I don't think it's taken into account often enough. Uh, I've even, I was uh, a counselor here in my local municipality for four years. And, um, we had a, this whole debate about fa uh, not facial recognition, but you know, security cameras in a public place. Should we, shouldn't we, uh, uh, the ramifications of that, the privacy implications, who had access, that sort of thing. And, and I asked lots and lots of questions because I wanted to make sure we had all the angles taken into account. Um, ultimately, I think, you know, we did as best we could to prevent the problems that were happening where the cameras were going to go and also making sure that not just every Tom, Dick and Harriet had access to the cameras at whenever they wanted to, or, or even the, v, the feed. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that people really need to think through a, th a little bit more thoroughly than they typically do. Um, so GNI has a bit of a history. Uh, uh, you're there as policy director. What's on the horizon for the Global Network Initiative and, and what do you hope to achieve? Yeah, so there, there I mean, as I, sort of alluded to earlier, there are, um, you know, uh, the, the space is incredibly dynamic. So not only do we have new laws like the GDPR, uh, the Europeans now have- Probably uh, a Canadian uh, one soon. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. The Canadian are, are, are going to demand, uh, Canadians are going to demand their pound of flesh uh, from, from the tech companies. Um, the UK is fairly far along in um, what they call their uh, online harms legislation um, process. Yeah, uh, the European Union has a similar uh, a project kind of of similar ambition to the GDPR, but focused more on content uh, regulation that uh, is, is under uh, it's in development. It's called the Digital Services Act. Um, we've seen India recently um, institute a, a whole set of new laws to try and address uh, content related harms. Uh, it's actually a set of regulations under an existing legal authority. 
Um, so the point is, you know, legislation uh, and, and regulation is happening at an increasing velocity um, around the world. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it's it, to some extent a, a legitimate response to some very significant concerns about the kinds of activities that are taking place online, malign influences, bullying, um, harms to specific vulnerable groups. On the other hand, um, for the reasons you and I just just talked about, um, you know, we find unfortunately that a lot of these laws and regulations are not as well thought through as they could have been. They're, they can often be politicized. Um, sometimes they're rushed uh, to respond to a particular political crisis or a moment of perce perceived need for some sort of you know government response, um, and uh, and as a result, the impacts end up you know um, either not addressing the underlying harm that they were set out to, to try and uh, mitigate and or uh, having unintended consequences uh, that nobody ever thought through, but but end up um, being particularly challenging for users and companies alike to address uh, as they try and continue to maintain an interoperable global internet uh, that right. allows for, you know, at least somewhat similar experience for, for you, whether you're in Ontario or in Mexico uh, or in Uganda. Um, and that's you know, that's really at the core of what we're trying to do and a lot of our members are are struggling to uh, to push for is is you know some um, you know maintenance of that kind of global internet which we think ultimately has been an incredibly valuable development uh, for society uh, and and we you know we think that um, it's worth fighting to preserve that um, even if sometimes it's an uphill battle um, you know with with legislators uh, and regulators um, we are trying to be a little bit more proactive um, I think in the past um, you know. The, the whole sort of community of internet uh, act, activists uh, from the kind of, you know, the standard setting nerds uh, to the, you know, the high profile, um, you know, company execs um, were guilty of sort of um, just kind of maybe a little bit of condescension uh, towards towards government actors and regulators saying, look, you know what, the internet, it, it's too complicated for you. Better <laughs> if you just don't touch it, you know, whatever you do is going to end up making it worse. So leave it alone. Let us fix the problems. We know how to deal with this. Um, and the reality is, you know, um, we haven't dealt with it, right? There are a lot of challenges, um, you know, some of which have been uh, mitigated um, and there's been important successes, um, but, but many more uh, are still, um, you know, um, out there and, and causing real harm for people. Uh, and we collectively have a responsibility to deal with them and, and we can't keep government out of that. Um, and I think now, Increasingly, people realize that you know governments are going to be a part of uh, the solutions to these problems, uh, one way or another. So it's better to work proactively with them, to educate them, to provide constructive proposals, uh, rather than just sort of you know wagging your finger at every effort and you know mocking every congressional hearing on uh, on social media. Um, so we recently, for example, put out a, a brief um, just in October of last year, looked at over two dozen different content, what we call content regulation initiatives, so efforts by governments, whether that's lawmakers passing new laws or courts interpreting existing laws or regulators stretching their authorities under existing laws. Um, what sort of, what they all had in common was an effort to deal with content related harms, right? So mm -hmm. everything from um, disinformation to bullying to hate speech, um, and, you know, people, countries have sort of experimented with trying to do that in different ways. We wanted to sort of take a step back and, and take an inventory of all those efforts, look at them all through the same prism, which is international human rights principles, you know, that were set out, um, you know, decades ago and are sort of universally subscribed to um, and are meant to ensure that we don't have the kinds of government overreach that has led to, you know, some of the you know, uh, calamities uh, of our recent history. And um, and then sort of, you know, through that lens, be able to come out with some advice for policymakers and lawmakers. Um, so we have a series of recommendations at the conclusion of that analysis, um, talking about, you know, the kinds of unintended consequences that unfortunately we were already seeing in some places, as well as where perhaps one country has actually found a way to do something you know, in a, in a more tailored and targeted way that we think is actually worth thinking about as a, as a model. Um, there is no, you know, to, to sort of cut to the chase, there is no single model legislation that's gonna work everywhere. Each country's of problems course. are different and their, their legal 
frameworks are, are sufficiently distinct that, that everyone's going to have to come up with their own approach. But I think there are principles and sort of high level guidance that, that, that can translate across borders. And, and we're very eager to try and help identify those and, and share our learnings with, with lawmakers and other stakeholders. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the things that the EU does as a general principle is that we, they can make the law at the European Council, but then each, each individual country has to ratify some version of it in order to put it into force. So that makes sense. I will preface this question with saying I'm a bit of a China hawk. Um, and if you don't have an opinion on this, you, you don't need to answer it. But I'm curious if you've been following um, the, uh, the PRC's People's Republic of China, the PRC's efforts recently to curtail a lot of the data collection that uh, Alibaba, Tencent, etc. do primarily within their apps. Uh, you know, if I'm using something with Alipay, obviously uh, Alibaba knows I've used Alipay and probably what I bought and how much I spent. Um, the the um, Chinese Communist Party has been curtailing a lot of those um, uh, ability to collect that data or kind of like what iOS 14.5 is doing with Facebook, or not with Facebook, with, but with advertising of like really clear um, uh, pop-ups of like, hey, do you still want to let Alipay or Tencent, you know, collect all this data, yes or no? A have you been following that at all? And, and like, I, personally, I see it as you're stopping the companies from collecting it. You're not necessarily stopping the government from collecting all that data still, which is more or less where my mind goes. And nobody seems to have uh, any rebuttal to at this point. Um, just wondering if you have a, uh, an opinion on that, if, if GNI is watching it uh, and um, where you think that might play. Yeah, uh, we, we pay, we pay uh, quite a bit of attention to what's happening in China, obviously going back to kind of the origin you know, the, the Yahoo case uh, and, and with the dissidents, yeah, so like that um, journalists. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, you know, for, for all of the, the time that we've been around, China has been experimenting with, you know, um, different ways to um, control both the companies uh, providing services on the internet, as well as users. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, one trend we can definitely identify over the course of, of that decade is, that those experiments have led have not just had impacts in China, right? So, so the lessons the Chinese Communist Party has learned, and and um, the technologies to some extent that they have developed to try and address uh, their concerns have proliferated, right? And so mm -hmm. we see that we see that happening naturally, just by by virtue of kind of the model that the Chinese government is presenting, um, and other countries saying, hey, you know, that seems attractive to us for whatever reason. Um, but yeah. we also see it uh, increasingly sort of being intentional on the part of the, the Communist Party, right? Um, it, you know, providing support, uh, whether that's through you know export credits or loans to Chinese companies to export hardware and, and increasingly services that are built on top of that hardware um, all over the world, uh, including surveillance, uh, uh, you know, technologies uh, and, and uh, approaches to surveillance. So, yeah, it's a, it's a big concern to us. I think what's interesting about what's happening, the sort of um, more recent friction between the Chinese government and some of these um, domestic national champions like, you know, uh, Alibaba and Tencent, um, illustrates that the Chinese government is still a government, right? And just like governments in Europe and in the United States and elsewhere, um, there is a sense that these companies are so big and have become so powerful that to some extent they, they challenge the authority of the state. And of course, right. I think the Chinese Communist Party is a, a bit more sensitive to that than perhaps more, uh, democratic <laughs> governments are. No. Um, but, but, they, <laughs> you know, but, but, but it is at its core, that concern isn't dissimilar, I think, with, you know, uh, some of the concerns that, that you hear from antitrust authorities in, in Europe, particularly in Europe, too, where there's a sense that, you know, many of the companies that are uh, accumulating all of this data and power are not European, right? They're either Chinese or American. Yeah. Um, and so that adds another level of sensitivity. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's a it's an interesting dynamic one to watch. Um, I, I, I tend to agree with you that the Chinese Communist Party would not limit their company's ability to gather data if it had an adverse impact on the government's ability to gather data. And so what that probably means, although I'm not enough of an expert to be able to confirm this, is that they have their own ways of being able to access that data um, right. and they don't need to rely on the companies for that. Um, 
but um, yeah, you know, exactly how that works uh, and how it will play out over time will be interesting to watch. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for uh, thanks for that. So back to the the issue of journalism, uh, freedom of the press. What what are some of your biggest concerns in terms of when it comes to protecting uh, the freedom of the press? Yeah, I think this is a really critical element um, of of kind of internet freedom and digital rights. And and often it's sort of under or remarked upon. G and I were very um, fortunate to benefit from some great member organizations like the Committee to Protect Journalists, um, International Media Support, uh, Internews that work on media development and media freedom all around the world. And so they're supporting uh, independent journalists and and others um, in in countries uh, where they're really you know, putting themselves at risk every day that they're going out and reporting on government corruption or, um, you know, uh, pandemic Protests response, in Hong Kong. things like that. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, one of the big, so there, I, I would sort of very crudely divide the concerns into kind of two categories. One is, is for the safety of journalists, right? And just the ability of journalists to use the internet and digital technologies to do their job, which is everything from getting information uh, and um, reaching out to sources and communicating confidentially with them to then putting out their reporting for, for others to learn from and, uh, and, and benefit from. Um, and that's become more challenging as governments have become more and more sophisticated in their ability to surveil, uh, um, you know, in particular, people who, who present uh, a threat, a perceived threat, and journalists often fit into that category. That's one set of concerns. I think there's another set of concerns that are a little bit more amorphous, but but no less significant, which is just, you know, obviously there's a lot of talk about the sort of changing business environment for journalism and, and the sort of threats to the business model of mainstream media. So putting that aside, I mean, I think just the information environment for journalism um, is, you know, it, on the one hand, the internet has been such a boon, right? You know, anybody with, um, you know, uh, a blogger account and a, and a sort of critical point of view and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and, you know, an undergraduate degree, and maybe not even that can, can put their opinions out there. And if they resonate, you know, they'll get attention and they can have influence and that's important. Um, but I think on the other hand, um, what we're seeing is, um, the ability to get access to information and, and to know sort of who are trusted sources of information, um, has become, um, at least for the user, the consumer side, um, m- much more challenging, right? And um, so I think we need to think a lot about kind of the demand side uh, of journalism. What do, what, do, what do we want from journalism as, as a public? And, um, and how do we make sure that we're getting that, even if the sort of advertising-based revenue model that had previously subsidized it is no longer functioning? Um, do we need to support public journalism? If so, how do we do that in a way that, make, that makes it truly independent and, and ensures that that public financing doesn't uh, create a deference towards the state and a lack of willingness to be critical of the state? Right. Um, you know, how do we how do we subsidize journalism in places where there there is no government or or business model there to support it? Right. So how do we support journalists in a country like Uganda, um, where the government is you know uh, quite repressive and uh, increasingly paranoid uh, about its grip on power? And how do we make sure we're supporting the brave individuals, whether they call themselves journalists or citizen bloggers or, mm-hmm. you know, advocates who who take their phone and live stream a protest to, to demonstrate to the world that this really happened, that there really is public discontent. Um, how do we support those folks, um, you know, make sure that they are able to continue to do their really valuable work? Um, it's a challenge. I think there's there's a lot of work um, that we all need to do. The, you know, the, the silver lining to me or the the, the positive side of that story is there are so many great organizations working on on those very challenges, um, and I'm inspired by them every day. Good, good to hear. Um, you kind of already alluded to this, but what about uh, social media's role in combating misinformation? You talked about, you know, it, it's you're right. It's really easy. I had a blogger account way back in the day, Live Journal, uh, etc. You know, it was really easy for me to to post information. I was not uh, posting false information as you know, boring teenage stuff. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, at the same time, there is obviously the the really quick ability for somebody to just post an entire website, and just post complete BS, um, and, which we've seen, especially in the States over the last four or five years, but certainly not isolated to the United States at all. Um, what about social media's role in, in combating that, that type of misinformation? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think of that as really, you know, um, not speaking for any social media company here in particular, but but I do think of it as um, it's not just something I I would consider part of their responsibility, and I do think it is kind of a, from a kind of business and human rights perspective, they they should be um, concerned about the fact that their their platforms could be misused, and they should be mm -hmm. addressing those risks. Um, but I also think in terms of kind of their business model, right? At the end of the day trust and user confidence are fundamental to their ability to continue to grow uh, and to, to sort of evolve and provide new services and, and continue to be relevant in this incredibly fast paced and dynamic sector. And I think um, being able to create an environment for your users, which on the one hand, continues to give them a, a certain autonomy in terms of not making them feel like you have conscripted them to a certain worldview or that you are you are forcing certain views down their throat but on the other hand um, protects them from the kinds of garbage that especially the kinds of garbage that is being you know maliciously developed and targeted right so there's you know there's yeah. lots of garbage out there in terms of opinions that that i might not agree with but um to the extent that it's someone just expressing their view I have no right, and I don't think a social media really a company has a right to to sort of restrict another person from being able to 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 consume that information. However, sure. that is a different scenario from you know an internet referral unit type operation, um, uh, you know where you've got uh, a you know a government um, or, or or a group of hackers, right? Some some you know some organized sort of intentional effort to. Um, mislead people and to feed them dangerous information that is knowingly, um, you know, um, false. And that's where I think there is there is a lot more room for um, engagement. The, the European Union, um, you know, to give them some credit, we, we sort of um, uh, I feel like we've been kind of critical of the the, the, <laughs> the GDPR and and so on the flip side to say you know on disinformation they they also took a strong role, um, you know, going back to 2017 where. Um, they set up a code uh, of, uh, uh, of conduct for some of the largest um, social media platforms, um, developed it with them. It was This was not a regulation, it was not a law that they had to comply with, but they certainly used their bully pulpit and the threat of regulation um, to <laughs> encourage those companies to do more and to be more transparent about what they were doing. Um, and, and a lot of progress is made. Now, much of that progress might have been made anyway, because the companies, as I said, I think have their own incentives. Uh, to deal with these issues, but it was, I think, nice to see the governments and the companies, even if they weren't always, you know, uh, even if there was some tension there in the background, trying to work this out collectively. What I would have liked to see and, and going forward, what, I, what G and I, I'm sure, uh, will continue to push for is more involvement of other sectors. So the media freedom organizations that I mentioned, the human rights organizations that are members of GNI, they also have a lot of really valuable input that they can feed into these conversations and these processes. Um, and without them, if it's just the governments and the companies kind of, you know, in a back room hashing out, you know, what they're going to do to address these big societal challenges, um, I don't think those kinds of the solutions that emerge from those back rooms aren't going to have the public trust uh, to really be sustainable and effective in the long term. So we really do need to make yeah. sure that there's um, you know, civil society engagement. The, the, the benefit or the, the upside is in this space in particular, this digital rights space, and I mentioned I've worked in human rights for, for decades and, and, and all kinds of different topics. This space has a particularly vibrant civil society, right? You've got everyone from technologists who do volunteer work on standard setting, um, to the you know the, the the very independent and critical uh, digital rights organizations um, like the EFF, Human Rights Watch, and others who yeah. um, who do lots of really good in depth reporting and investigation, um, and all of them ultimately are trying to serve a public good, serve the public, uh, and and sort of conceptualize the public good, and um, and so I think governments and companies that don't bring them in to the decision making and the solution finding processes. Uh, are kind of shooting themselves in the foot, right? They're, they're out there, um, available uh, for advice and for input, and and that's what GNI really tries to do, right? We pre we provide kind of a, a trusted umbrella under which these different stakeholders can come together, have open and honest discussion. It's better if we don't always agree, right? Out of that disagreement will come critical insights, valuable learning, uh, and hopefully proactive solutions. Cool. Oh, we're coming up on on the the hour here, so I want to try and squeeze in two more questions. Um, 
on that point of of combating misinformation and that sort of thing to the extent that I would agree, you know, somebody's op-ed essentially, whether it's a blog or it's in the uh, the Washington Times or the National Post, you know, it's an op-ed. Like they're allowed to 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 post their opinion. Is there is there a role for um, for social media networks and and other platforms like that to actually moderate that content, or do you think like? Like, what about Facebook labeling just about everything <laughs> that went up on Facebook late last fall towards your your uh, your last election, you know, national nationwide election there? Yeah. Yeah, I think there I think, listen, um, we know what an unmoderated Internet looks like. Um, and while we may, you know, those of us who are old enough have kind of these romantic memories of, you know, open chat boards that, you know, generally you know, there was always kind of crap and, and spam, but but we were able to kind of filter our way through them and find the, the gold seams in, in that mine of information and, and yeah. develop, you know, meaningful relationships and communities. Um, but that was an internet of, you know, a couple million people, right? Now we're dealing with the whole world on the internet and governments, uh, you know, trying to exercise malign influence and all kinds of, you know, pro profit seeking um hacking and 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 you know um, misinformation to take advantage of, of digital advertising revenue so there's all kind of, it's a very different world and i think yeah. um you know an unmoderated social media platform in this world looks like eight coon right it, it's not a it's not a it's not a happy place um and so i i do think that we have to have moderation on the internet i think what the challenge has been over the last you know 10 years um, and it's only gotten more acute um uh, of late is how do companies do that in a way that's seen as principled and to the extent possible, you know, fair, non-discriminatory, um, you know, and a lot of that comes down to being transparent, um, having clear rules, um, providing due process, some, some mechanism for remedy um, that, it, that actually, you know, affords people a chance to, at the very least, complain if they feel like they're, um, if a decision was made contrary to their interests, um, maybe even if it's not, even if they don't end up getting their content restored once it's been taken down, I think the, pro the ability to be heard can be quite meaningful and impactful. Um, all of those things that I just mentioned are human rights principles, right? They come out of international human rights law. Uh, and so much of what GNI is trying to do is, is help companies as well as other stakeholders understand how those human rights principles can guide um, the development of their, you know, whether it's uh, statutes at the, at the government level or content moderation at the company level, um, so that it ends up being, um, um, you know, more sustainable and more effective. Cool. Um, so I, I, you kind of already went into this, but maybe you can expand on, on it a little bit and then we'll, we'll wrap up here. How can human rights laws or, or maybe the international human rights framework, how can those frame and help guide those Probably the regulations that are coming that are coming into effect, you know, in the really near future here, the UK, Canada, and other places. Yeah. So again, uh, you know, with the caveat that every country is going to have to take a, a different approach, and we don't, we don't, uh, we certainly aren't advocating for a sort of single top-down UN sort of governance, <laughs> uh, you know, set of rules for the internet. Um, sure. Uh, especially when it comes to tricky issues like content regulation. Um, I think uh, at the end of the day, the, the the principles and the, and the lessons that come out of international human rights law, and here we're speaking specifically really about um, the human rights to freedom of expression, which is important to realize doesn't just include my right to speak and be heard, but also my right to have an opinion, uh, whether or not I'm articulating that and how, how is my ability to develop my own opinion in fact, um, uh, impacted by decisions other people make in terms of what information I can receive. Uh, my access to information, right? All of that is in, encapsulated under the, the right to freedom of expression under international human rights law. And then the right to privacy. Um, those right. are the sort of key rights. Those are often um, referred to as enabling rights because without them, um, other important rights and processes, um, you know, like the right to free assembly, the right to freedom of association, the right to protest, the right to, um, you know, um, uh, to, to realize you know your individual uh, goals as as a person um, to participate in a democratic society, all of those things are dependent uh, to some extent on, on, on you know, having the security of privacy and, and having um, the ability to to form your opinions and express yourself um, as you as you like. So those those rights, I think um, you know there's a there's a kind of a a simple um, set of 
principles, uh, in particular when you look at the way freedom of expression has been understood um, by international courts and special rapporteurs and the, the UN system, um, you know, the, and the three, it's, there's a three-part test to freedom of expression that um, breaks down in, in, into three principles. The first is um, legitimacy, right? So any effort, whether we're talking about a government or a company to restrict someone's free expression um, must be done transparently. Um, whatever it is that's prohibited, you know, the prohibition of speech really has to be the exception, right? And so it has to be clearly articulated so that an individual can you know, look at the rule, understand the rule and govern their own behavior accordingly in order to not violate the rule, but also so that they don't end up restricting more expression than they need to, right? And this becomes particularly important when we're talking about a government, as they are increasingly doing, relying on a company to ultimately be the one who decides, right? You know, we see more and more governments saying, look, there's so much content out there, we could never police it all. So what we're gonna do is basically tell the companies, you gotta find and take down all of the hate speech, for example. Okay, well then you better tell that company in very clear terms what constitutes hate speech and what doesn't. Otherwise, the company is gonna take the broadest possible interpretation in order not to fall afoul of the law, right? And they're gonna take down guts. all kinds of content, which, you know, even the government itself would admit, hey, that's not hate speech. But at the end right. of the day, you can't really blame a company for wanting to protect itself, right? So that's that's the legitimate, the legality um, principle. Um, the other one is legitimacy. And so there, the idea is, you know, you can't just restrict speech because, you know, you think it's critical of the government, right? You can't just, uh, you know, limit speech because, um, because it makes you uncomfortable. Um, there are specific reasons why under international human rights law, it is legitimate to restrict speech, things like national security and public order. Um, now what those mean in practice, that there's a lot of conversation to be had there, but I think um, it also just underscores the need for whoever is restricting the speech to articulate the reasons, not just say, hey, um, you know, I'm setting down these rules and you've got to follow them, but really explaining why you think this is a justified restriction um, and uh, and that ultimately goes a long way towards building, um, you know, trust and, and compliance, right? If people understand the reasons for the rules, they're much more likely to accept them and, come, and abide by them. And then the last um, principle is the principle of necessity. And a lot gets packed in there, um, but ultimately, you know, I see that as really being about um, being targeted, right? So um, you know, talk about being proportionate, right? If you are concerned about terrorist, uh, you know, incitement online. Um, making sure whatever you know restriction you put in place is actually dealing with that, um, and not you know sweeping in a whole bunch of other stuff um, unintentionally. Um, also thinking about um, the due process kind of uh, safeguards, right? So okay, we're going to restrict speech, and we appreciate that no matter how carefully we ta we define the restriction and we tailor whatever the mechanism is, we're, there's going to end up being some false positives. Um, so how do we mitigate that, and how do we give people redress? If they found themselves on the wrong end of a decision, whether that's a court process or a company's own uh, content moderation decision, um, we need to make sure that people have an ability to seek redress. That's not just important to the individual, of course, it's very important to them, but it's important to the process, right? The system learns by analyzing its own mistakes. And that happens just in the same way for governments as it does for a company. Uh, if we don't have a feedback mechanism that allows us to find out when we get things wrong, we won't learn, right? And the system will will not improve over time. Um, so those are the kinds of principles and, and you know, there are more uh, and there's a lot of great work that's been done by, uh, you know, among others, people like uh, David Kay, who's uh, the board chair at the Global Network Initiative, who is the former UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, um, to really try and unpack these principles and understand what they mean for this digital age. Um, and then also think about, you know, not only what do they mean for governments, but what do they mean for, for companies, especially these big global platforms that increasingly are, are doing the business of governance, right? I mean, they're private companies, but in the systems and the rules that they pass and the mechanisms that they set up, they are governing millions and millions of people around the world, their ability yeah. uh, to express themselves, their privacy, um, and they need to take those seriously. And, you know, I think with, uh, with the GNI members, at least I, I think we can say, they don't always get it right, but they are taking it seriously. That's good to hear. I think that's a great note to, to end on. Thanks so much, Jason, for your time this afternoon. And I hope everybody really enjoyed listening. And until we see you next time, stay free. My pleasure. Thanks very much.